Hey everyone, it's Scott Hansen here from NFL Red Zone reminding you to check out H2 Sports Podcast for all the latest and greatest on the NFL, the Giants, and all your favorite sports, courtesy of Abby Halpin. You listen to Abby. She knows her stuff. She's a future star. H2 Sports. Check it out. Thank you, Scott Hansen. Before we get into this episode of the H2 Sports Podcast, I wanted to let y'all know that this episode is not only available on Spotify, it is not only available on Apple Podcasts, but it's also available on the Post-COVID Post. The Post-COVID Post is a news website created by myself and about 15 other high school journalists around the country through the Summer Academy at the University of Georgia. We had to pick a story to report on, to cover, and I picked the story of... Mick Mixon announcing his retirement. I feel like, in, especially in the Charlotte area, in terms of the Panthers, in terms of sports media in general, this is a big moment because he has been, as you'll hear, he has been doing play-by-play for the Carolina Panthers for 16 years. And Mick announced recently that this coming season, the 2021 NFL season, would be his last behind the microphone. And I thought that was a very important story to cover. As someone who has met Mick several times, you he is such a joy, and it will come through in this interview. So here is Mick Mixon of the Panthers Radio Network. Welcome back to the H2 Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halpin, and today I am not joined by my dad. I am joined by... The legend himself, the 16-year play-by-play radio announcer for the Carolina Panthers, Mick Mixon. Thank you for joining me. How are you today? Abby, I'm doing so well. Made even my day's made even better now by this uh, interview and your your lead-in. Your dad is the the legend. I'm nobody, but (laughs) I remember when you were just a little Abby Halpin hanging around your dad in the TV studio when we recorded various Carolina Panther shows and. All of us tried to convince you to set your goals higher than sports journalism, but it doesn't look like we've been successful. (laughs) No, I really like doing it. I'm glad that we get to talk today because I get to write a story for a journalism camp that I'm in. And since this news of your retirement was so recent, I figured that it would be the perfect story to tell through audio. Well, it's not really news. I'm nobody. Coach Krzyzewski retiring. That's a story. Roy Williams retiring. That's a story, but your humble correspondent doing one more year. I guess it's a story in my uh, at my address. My immediate family is interested in it, but it's just been a great ride. I've been so blessed and so fortunate to have great jobs and fantastic people with whom to work. And it's hard to believe that I'll be 63 in October, and it'll soon be time to take it to the farm and get on a tractor and enjoy the next part of my life. What made you decide that, yep, this is the year, this is going to be my final time in that booth behind that mic? A couple of factors, Abby. I, I won't talk a long time about it because um, it's probably kind of boring, but I've been in cover bands for a lot of my life. I love playing drums. I used to wonder as a young boy why my parents drank a lot, and I used to think it was a character flaw in their part but maybe it was me upstairs practicing the drums nonstop that made them do that but um, in in playing in cover bands Abby one of the things you learn is that you don't want to overplay it's far better to leave a crowd chanting at you one more song one more song than to have the manager come over with the throat across the thumb across the throat saying you, you should have been done 20 minutes ago have this be your last song. So to just be able to orchestrate it is enticing to me. The other thing is my parents died young. My mom and dad passed away when my dad was 57 and my mom was 54. It's a small part of my motivation, but it's some that they never got to enjoy the last of life for which the first was made as Tennyson wrote. And so I want to save some time. I want to save some time to hang out with my See, there's one of my grandsons right now, Casey. Hi. Hi, Casey. Well, who wouldn't want to hang out with Casey and teach him how to be a young man, help teach him and teach him how to how to do things and 
watch him grow up. So, uh, but I love being a sports announcer. It's all I've ever wanted to be. And it's all I've ever thought about being, but I don't want to be one of those guys that hangs on too long, loses his fastball and has everybody saying, well, how come he's still in the chair? You mentioned that you've always known you wanted to be a sports announcer. Was there a moment or an event in your life that you said, yeah, this is what I want to do? Uh, yeah, um, I tried to tackle Rodney Taylor in youth league football when I was 10 years old, and he carried me 69 yards. I finally got him <laughs> down at about the five-yard line, and I got up from that thinking, you know, I love football, but I should probably try – given that I do not have the robust physical stature that I was hoping for, <laughs> I should probably try to figure out another way. And soon after that, I saved up my money, babysitting, lawn mowing money. That's how people did it back in my day. They, uh, their parents tried to simulate the Great Depression and you know, send you off to work when you can't even, don't even have a driver's license yet. So I saved my money and bought a WebCore cassette tape recorder. And I did a lot of what you're doing now. I looked around for people. I didn't even ask their permission. I just went up to them and started interviewing them. And I started describing games of pickup basketball that I was in. Every time I played golf, I'd have this running narrative, either out loud or in my mind, of Mickey mixing the, the <laughs> vascular left-hander from Chapel Hill steadies over this eight-foot side hill putt at Finley Golf Course. Can he do it? And so I just would just do the play-by-play -play even when no one was listening. And that's just kind of how it went. So you mentioned the Chapel Hill thing. What made, how did you, like, what made you decide to go to Chapel Hill? What other colleges were involved in your decision? Or was it, did you always know you wanted to be a Tar Heel? No, no I did not. I grew up a Duke SC State fan and I liked Wake Forest. My father was a chemist, a chemical engineer. He was this, uh, Socratic, nerdy scientist. He was a lar He was a good size man. He was six three, about two hundred twenty pounds, but very bookish and and a man of very few but very well chosen words. My mother was totally different. She was wild. I mean, just as wild as a jackrabbit. She was from New York. She loved Bette Midler. She loved Carol Burnett. She loved the Lucille Ball. She thought she should have been all those people. And she had that kind of personality, huge personality. She could sing and dance and do voices and do impressions. She was also a little moody. You know, there's a dark side to it. So the combination of these genetics um, kind of caused me to think, well, uh, this is just crazy. How do these two people even get together? How do they even love each other? They were so different. But I just, I don't know, Abby, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to go somewhere other than UNC because I grew up in Chapel Hill. So I love Duke and State and, um, but I applied to, I don't even know where I applied. I think I applied to some schools, Georgia, Syracuse, that had good communication departments, probably didn't even get into them. So I just went to UNC and it wasn't until I went to Carolina that I really started loving the school and what it stood for. Now, did you go after you graduated? Did you go straight to calling uh, the main guides baseball games, or did you do something in between that? Lord, no. I um, I graduated. You can look it up. Not that you will or should, but I graduated on Saturday, May the eleventh, nineteen eighty. Long time ago. I don't even think your parents were born yet. On Sunday, May the twelfth, nineteen eighty, I moved. In my 1963 Chevy Nova, tied a mattress on top of it, had a stereo system, moved to Belmont right outside Charlotte. And on Monday, May 13th, 1980, that was my first full day of work at a small radio station in Belmont. My boss there, and how I got that job was totally random, but I, I got it with about a month to go in my senior year at UNC. My boss told me, son, you can broadcast anything you want to in this county so long as it's got a sponsor. <laughs> so the deal was I would go out and sell ads. I do, I do a morning show or I do a midday show. I'd spin records, do the news. Then I'd go sell ads and get people to sponsor or try to what I really wanted to do, which was live sports on the radio, high school football, basketball, baseball, 
dirt track car racing, amateur boxing, peewee football, junior midget, Pop Warner football, and it was a joyous Noel of a life back then. When, so when did you get up to Maine? I went from WCGC in Belmont. I was there 19 months. Then I got a job at WIS Radio in Columbia, South Carolina. This is a majestic, old, time-honored, decorated radio station. One of these all-purpose radio stations that covered the community with a news department that searched aggressively for stories, had, had representation at the town council meeting, county commissioners, anything that moved in that area, they, WIS Radio covered it. We had nine people full-time in news, two of us full-time in sports. It was a great time to be, a, to be working in radio. Not that this isn't, but back then it was, it was incredible. So I was there for about five years, and then I went to Maine in 19, let's see, I guess it was the 1987 Maine Guides that I covered. How did that prepare you for announcing football games? Because baseball and football are very different, and they move at very different paces. How did that prepare you for announcing football fantastic question and i would expect that of a helping <laughs> so you're quite correct baseball this is just my opinion anyway baseball is the petri dish that an announcer can grow in if he or she wants to do it wants to work at it but it's not easy and it's not for everybody because baseball so in Maine, AAA Maine guides, I did 140 nine-inning baseball games in about 160 days by myself. So imagine the hours on the air. Yeah, that's imagine a lot. Imagine the extra. I know. As your generation would say, I know, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love how y'all put the right in there as a question mark. I don't know how that <laughs> happened, but I've noticed it. So nine innings. Almost every day, you're either you're either on air or you're catching a flight, getting on the team plane to go to the next city. And you have to doing that. You have to get better, even if you don't want to. You have to find a different ways to describe the action. You have to work at your craft. You have to get better as an interviewer. The listener has only you to figure out what do these players look like. What are what are their tattoos? What are their how are they built? What are their personalities? What about these stadiums? What do they look like? Is it natural grass? Is it artificial turf? Is it a sunny day? Is it stormy? What, what in the blue heck is going on with these games? So it doesn't matter whether you have to go to the bathroom. It doesn't matter if you have a head cold. It doesn't matter if your girlfriend's not taking your calls from this gosh forsaken place up in Maine. You just have to get on the air and you have to do it. So I feel like it was kind of an accelerant. Not that I'm any, and believe me, uh, yeah, broadcasting is, in, is, is inexact. It's organic. Some people may love the way you do a game. Some people may like the way I do a game. We might do a game differently. So I'm not trying to present myself as any kind of, like, as if I've arrived on the, on the scene as somebody who knows how to do it. It's not like that at all. Every, every game in the, in the NFL, every game I'll do this coming season, it'll, it'll be like a, it's my first game in that I want to get better. I want to listen to the tape from that game. I want to figure out what we did right or wrong. But in Maine, it was this accelerant where I just learned so much. And one of the things I learned was um, you got to be a storyteller. You got to be able to hold the narrative. Not every game is going to be exciting. Three to two, bottom of the ninth, bases loaded, two out. Here's the three, two pitch. A lot of it is you're getting your, you know what kicked, but you still got, a, you still got six more innings. And you got to figure out a way to tell some stories and keep people interested. I like to say it this way. Broadcasting on the radio. Radio is a magical medium. If it's done right, it can be, it can do things television can't do. It can create a meeting place where you can take it along with you. It can be your friend. You can pick it up and put it down. You can do other things while you listen. You don't have to just sit there and watch. And so I love trying to create a meeting place where people can hang out and where they feel like they're spending time with somebody that will connect you to the game in a full, fair, accurate way. Maybe tell some stories, maybe even with his colleagues would have the gift of humor 
an unpredictability about the broadcast where we might say something, we might delve into pop culture, we might say something a little bit off topic, it might cause you to smile and want to listen for just a few seconds longer than you might if you just wanted to hear the score and the time remaining. Is You talk about how much you love doing radio. Yeah. When you did Panther Talk, did you like being on camera or did you do you prefer being just behind the microphone? Well, they say that TV adds 10 pounds. And <laughs> so I like that, that I looked more robust than, uh, than I might normally. I've had people in the pandemic say to me, um, uh, you know, that dude doesn't have the virus. Nobody does. And of course, uh, I've not, I've been lucky. I hadn't had the, the virus, but I was just born kind of ectomorphic, I guess you might say. So I guess I like, you know, I like being on, on, on t television because, uh, people do watch the millennial brain, the, your generation, what generation are you? X, Z, Y, I, I can't Z. even remember. I believe Z. You're Z. Okay. So yeah. the Gen Z set, you know, you guys are visual, you know, you want to see, want to see it and hear it maybe. But really at my core, I, I just, I like, I'd rather, I'd rather be on the radio. I'd rather be tasked with trying to describe the sights, the sounds, the textures, instead of just assuming that, well, you can see it because it's TV. So you don't need me to describe it. You also worked at the Tar Heel Sports Network, I believe, after you worked in Maine. How is covering college sports different than professional sports? Not much different. The players are the same. You would think that when they get to the NFL, they're real serious and, excuse me, don't horse around, don't play games of bin ball in the locker room, don't snap each other with rat tails come with towels coming out of the shower, that kind of thing. But that's not true. It's all, they're just big kids, more highly compensated when they get to the NFL. The difference though, Abby, is that NFL games have a bigness to them. I used to talk about this with your dad. Late November, two teams with losing records play in the NFL. There are so few NFL games and every game affects other teams that there's there's just a bigness to these games that, that I feel. The sociology of these games where, where people come and they want to cheer the Panthers on. And the people who come are fans of different colleges, graduates of different colleges. The people who come have different skin colors. They have different beliefs. They have different ages. They have different socioeconomic status. And the Panther, Panther games are just this, it's this huge magnet right in the epicenter of Charlotte, this vibrant center of banking and commerce where they draw people in. I've seen Fortune 500 CEOs and homeless people on the street corner high five and hug with, with the excitement of a, of a Panther game or a Panther victory. So I love that. You get some of that with college athletics, but to me, there's just a, there's just a bigness to these, these Panther games that, that I, I love and I'll definitely miss. So you went, you worked in Belmont, you worked in Maine, and you worked back in Chapel Hill after you graduated. What led you to Charlotte? What led you to the Panthers radio network? Panthers had parted company with their former play-by-play -play guy, a guy named Bill Rosinski, and they reached out to me to ask me if I would be interested in applying for the job. At that time, I was happy in uh, Chapel Hill. I was teaching some classes in the journalism school. I'd started a, uh, a cover band called the Franklin Street Band. I was doing a little bit of TV, some freelance work, and I wasn't looking to, to, to leave that. It was a pretty good set of gigs. So I said to the Panthers, look, if, if, you just, if you just want to check a box and have me come down, let's just call it. I'll be a Panther fan. You guys can listen to the Carolina games. And we'll part company as friends. And no, need to, no need to waste each other's time with me coming down because I didn't have that much football play-by-play -play experience. But they said, no, we want you to come down. We think maybe you can do things in this job that would be meaningful to us in the community and that kind of thing. So I said, okay. So I came down, got on my coat and tie, drove down all day, full day interview. I was exhausted at the end. It's, it, believe me, it's, it takes a lot uh, out of you to, to put not only your best foot forward, but both of your best feet forward for an entire day, remembering people's names, daggum, trying to be charming and all that. Well, when I got home from that day, I thought, 
this is an exceptional organization. I went for the interview thinking this will just be, yeah, it'll be kind of fun. I'll meet some people. But they'll move on from me and look at other candidates. But at the end of that day, I thought, man, if I can get this job offered to me, I need to, to try to accept it and throw my whole heart into it because this is an unbelievable organization. People at the tops of their games in every office. And so that's kind of how it happened. When the Panthers were established in 1995, you mentioned that you were a big Duke fan, big NC State fan. Did you pay attention to the Panthers at all? Or was there another NFL team that you were a fan of? I didn't really like the Panthers. Don't get me in any trouble by me saying this. But I viewed the – but you have to understand it this way. I viewed the Panthers' arrival as corrosive to college sports, predatory to the Atlantic Coast Conference. I was working in college athletics then, so who would want a big – 2,000 pound gorilla to just come into this ecosystem and swat these little college teams away like they're little airplanes buzzing at its head. And that's the NFL. Like it or not, the NFL is powerful. The NFL shield is a more recognizable global logo than almost every other trademark except the Olympic rings and the golden arches. So this, these letters, NFL, it means something. And so I thought, uh oh, here comes the, the sports entertainment pie sliced and diced and chopped by the arrival of the Carolina Panthers. Of course, when I joined the Carolina Panthers, I thought, hey, now this is this is fantastic. Get a, get away from us. These you little you little college planes. When you joined, was Jim Zoki already working for them on Sundays or was there somebody else with you? No, the Zoke was there. Oh, how do you guys project your chemistry to your listeners? Because you guys seem to work very, very well together. How do you take the chemistry and make sure that your listeners understand it and acknowledge that? You're kind to say that. I think I could speak for the Zoke when I say that the way we do that is we don't try to do it. Does that make any sense? Yeah. If you try to artificially inseminate humor or chemistry, that's the, see, that's the problem with television is that a lot of these pregame shows, NFL Today, you got Kurt, you got Howie, you got Terry, you got all these people sitting there, and and it's scripted. They Somebody somewhere, somebody in the truck, somebody in the studio, somebody in New York or L.A. has said, okay, we come back from this break, you get uh, Howie, you give Terry a hard time about his hair, and then you guys kid around with Jimmy for a second and then throw to the feature. And that's just, that's an insult. Why can't it be like radio? Why can't it just be, why can't you just let, just take, let it, I mean, you have to have some structure. You can, it can't just be just this, this big, just this random uh, people, all, everybody talking at once. But on the radio, it's what I love about it. Sometimes Jim and I, we, we start out being serious, but somebody will say something. Somebody will make a little comment and then we get derailed like a train going off the tracks and we start, I can't tell you how many times Jim has given me the giggles <laughs> and before you know it, we're trying to address a fairly serious, at least to us, sports topic on a 60 station radio network and around the world on the internet and I can't get my breath because I'm laughing so hard at something he has said or the reverse has been true. I love it. How have you guys maintained that over since over the last 16 years? How have you kept that? I think the main way that you do it, there's two ways you do it. Number one is you have to listen to one another on the air. You have to listen. So many broadcasters now, it just drives me crazy when I hear one broadcaster say something and then the other broadcaster obviously hasn't listened to what that person said. Hear it all the time. Well, Abby, looks like number 20, Mike Cook, is warming up in the bullpen. And then you come back and say, thanks, Mick. Here's a fastball. Wild high for ball two. Well, looks like Mike Cook, number 20, is warming up in the bullpen. Well, I just said that. 
but broadcasters don't listen to each other. The areas of their brain that listen have become atrophied over time because they're too concerned with their Instagram and their Twitter and their Facebook and, oh, oh, me, 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 like me, like my status, give me a thumbs up, let me get that dopamine hit of people be thinking that I'm popular and good. That's asinine. Your, your, your job is to connect people to the game, not to try to work on your personal brand. So I think Jim Zoki believes this too. So the two of us really don't care who gets, who makes the, the, the funny comment or who breaks the story or who says what needs to be said. We, we just want someone to have said it. Is it different? What is the, how is the atmosphere different announcing home games versus away games? Cause I know you guys get to travel with the team. You get to go with them uh, except for this past season. But how is it different? What's the atmosphere? How has it changed from Charlotte to uh, New Orleans or Atlanta? There's nothing like uh, a home game at Bank of America Stadium. There's nothing like it. The, the noise floor when the stadium is full, the seeing the stadium come to life, the smells of the popcorn being popped and the sodas being poured and other beverages, the hot dogs, the barbecue from the barbecue shack, it smell just gets all over the stadium and hear the drumline percussion. You hear them start rehearsing. Boom, boom, those rhythmic sounds. It's unbelievable. So there's nothing like that. You know that when the Panthers do something great, you know, the crowd just tells you before we can even relay it on the radio. On the road, it's totally different. It's the opposite, but it's, but it's, you're, you know, you're, you're going into this, you're going into this intimidating theater trying to steal what the other team so desperately wants, which is a home win. And so you take your joy, your joy is coming in a different way if you win in, in quieting the crowd and seeing when those buses pull away and you'd see all the dejected home fans. There's nothing like that. So it's two very different things, but both pretty intoxicating. Did you, what, how was not travel? You guys couldn't travel outside of the, the NFC South last year, I believe. How was that? What was different about announcing the game, but not actually being there? It forced us, great question. It forced us to go back to that, that place in childhood I was telling you about. It forced you to go back to the, that theater of the mind, as people in radio say, and invent things and make it up and not making up down distance personnel grouping, how many yards were gained on the play, but to, to pretend as if you're there, but you're not there. And so I wouldn't want to go through it again, but I really enjoyed it in a, in a way, having to concentrate even harder on making sure that even something as simple as coming back from a break, that when you come back from a break, we never said that we were at the, the game if we weren't, but what would be wrong with, with saying uh, U.S. Bank Stadium Vikings versus the Panthers and and at U.S. Bank Stadium, the sun streaming into these glass windows that they have to, in the West End Zone. In other words, we can describe the field conditions, the way the wind's blowing, the way the weather is, and not say that we're there, but not say that we aren't, and 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 hopefully give people the idea that they're they're there with us. That's our job in, in the first place. While you were on the while you were working with them, did you have a favorite player or a favorite personality, I guess, in the locker room? No, they're all like my, my children. So I love them all. I love some of them more than others. Uh, Thomas Davis is amazing. Luke Keekley, J.J. Jansen, Greg Olson could talk the horns off of Billy Goat. I love those guys. Uh, it, could, it could go on and on. I mean, it's really players from different eras. O, the O-line... Offensive linemen, it's its own. Those guys are their own thing. I mean, what makes them laugh? What makes them? What motivates them? The skill set required. Um, you know, th those guys. Uh, th those guys are incredible. They dance to the beat of a tune that only they can hear. So Ryan Khalil, Jordan Gross, Jeff Hangardner, uh, people like that. I really enjoyed 
just kind of putting my f- face against the glass and peering into their world and trying to learn about it. You mentioned Greg Olson and Thomas Davis. They had their joint retirement ceremony recently and you got to kind of MC it, kind of host it. What was the atmosphere like in that room? Because I watched that and I felt that it was kind of emotional. What was it like being there in that room? Yeah, I'm glad that came through to you, Abby. I think it was accurate to what was in the room. It, it was a combination of a birth, how it might feel in the delivery room when there's a new birth, because these players were being born into and pushed out into a new world for them outside of football. But it also kind of felt funereal in a way, almost like something had died because they're at the end of something that they had so completely and so passionately thrown themselves into. But overall, it was a really a happy ceremony and, and, and the good feelings outweighed the, the bad by a wide margin. And it was cool to hear the players talk about each other, to hear Greg Olson talk about what Thomas Davis meant to him and vice versa. And it tells you what, what I was saying earlier that for some reason, people of different types are able to get along so, so much better on athletic teams than they are in society at large. You talk about good moments, happy feelings. Do you have a favorite game, favorite Panther game that you had to pick? Maybe one or two. Your favorite one that you've ever gotten to announce? I guess the... Of course, the NFC Championship game in 2015 against Arizona. Just And I say that not for any um, award-winning broadcast we might have done or not done that day, but just how the stadium felt. I mean, the, the city was off the chain with the excitement of that game. And I got chills right now just even talking to you about it. I'm a music guy, so I love Super Bowl 50 when Lady Gaga, Stephanie Germanata is her real name. She sang the national anthem. And she did that with no Spartacus-like, no huge production, no dancers, no fireworks going off. It was just her on the global stage with a grand piano and her accompanist. And she crushed it. I mean, just her, her, the vocal, the control she had, the breath control. She wasn't, if she was nervous, she didn't appear nervous. She nailed it right as the Blue Angels are flying over in perfect formation. Sun setting in that California sky. I mean, that was something that I'll think back on long. But as long as I'm alive, really, I'll remember that night. Do you plan on going to a lot of games sitting in the stands after you retire? Because I assume it's been a while since you've gotten to watch in the stands. No, I plan on going to no games. I plan on, I'm not the hanger, I'm not a hanger on or a hanger around her. If I do go to a game, I won't, it won't be any fanfare. We'll just go sit in the stands, look around, take it all in. This tailgating thing, though, looks like it's got a chance. Tailgating looks like a lot of fun, and I've never done yeah. it. It's a lot. I might, yeah. I might, is it fun? Yeah, it really is. I might just tailgate and then go home and listen on the radio. Will it be weird not listen? Like, I don't know if weird's the right word, but would it be. In, yeah, I'm just going to say weird. Would it be weird listening to somebody other than yourself do play by play? Kind of. I mean, I like cars and I've sold, bought and sold some cars in my lifetime. And every time I sell a car that I loved, I think someone's driving my car. It's not me, but they're behind the wheel. They have their foot on the gas. They have their stuff in the glove box. So it might feel a little bit like that to me when I tune into the Carolina Panthers radio network, but I'm ready to, whatever the feelings are, I'm ready for them. And I'm going to celebrate uh, that, whoever that, that uh, person is, whether they're male or female, young or old, black or white, whatever, doesn't matter. I'm, I just can't wait to see and hear how they, they do the game, and I'm sure they'll do great. Take a step back from the broadcasting journalism side of it. Are you excited about the team this season? Because they've got some new additions. They've got a Brent, they've got Sam Darnold in at quarterback. McCaffrey will come back hopefully healthy. But you also lose Curtis Samuel. Are you excited to watch how this team works this season? I'm more than excited. Is there a plateau? What's a plateau? What words can we think of above excited? <laughs> I'm on Thrilled. fire. Thrilled, yeah. Yeah, just I feel like I could 
put on shoulder pads and a helmet right now and run down the field. If Matt Rule asked me to, I would run down the field and cover a kickoff. That's how right. fired up I am about this team. They will be. I Do you think the connection that Darnold had with Anderson in New York will still be there? I think so. I think Sam Darnold is, is, was a great pickup. And not just with Robbie Anderson, but I really think that McCaffrey and Darnold will 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 sister together quite nicely. I think that Sam, I think that Dan Arnold, this new tight end, coupled with Tommy Tremble and of course Ian Thomas returning, I think the tight end position could could be set to really blossom in this offense. And defensively, we're already right now today, as you and I are talking, Abby Halpin, we're already longer, leaner, faster, twitchier, angrier on defense than we were a year ago. So you like the pick of J.C. Horn? You liked that pick? Oh, gosh. Wait till you see J.C. Horn. Really? Okay. J.C. Horn was the talk of the media on the bank when the the first rookie minicamp practice occurred. Everyone's looking at J.C. Horn going, that's J.C. Horn? That's <laughs> that's six one. That's what six one two hundred pounds looks like. That's not a normal six one two hundred. He's got these little racehorse ankles that are built for speed, but then he's got this muscular set of calves and thighs, and then it goes up from there. I mean, he looks like a man. Can't okay. wait to see him. Because I know there were a few, a lot of fans that were thinking, oh, maybe they'll take quarterback maybe they'll take somebody else but that pick that makes me feel a lot better about that pick you should feel great about the pick good congratulations on an incredible career i'm so excited to get to listen to you for another season it's going to be really sad when you leave but thank you so so much for joining me and congratulations on an outstanding run you're very sweet abby i'm excited that you're excited and just don't take my job let me have my job for one more year. Let me do this season. Then you can apply and maybe you'll be the next voice of the Carolina Panthers. I would, I was joking with Jim Zoki about that on Twitter. Actually, when the news first broke, I was like, do you, I said, I asked him, I said, do you know when applications are open? Like, you take <laughs> I'm this glad year. I'm not on Twitter. Otherwise I would have seen that and I would have had to track you down, <laughs> <laughs> but have fun with this final season. Have fun at the beach. Enjoy it with your family. And thank you so, so, so much. Will do, Abby. Thank you for the visit. Thank you. I hope y'all enjoyed listening to the interview as much as I enjoyed conducting it. Mick was such a pleasure to talk to. He's such a joy. You can tell he works so, so hard at what he does, and he's worked so hard to get where he is today. I want to congratulate him on an incredible career and wish him the best of luck in his retirement after the 2021 NFL season. I also want to make sure wherever you are listening to this too, whether it be on Apple, whether it be on Spotify, please make sure to give the post-COVID post a check. We have been working so hard, myself and the other students involved, we've been working so hard on our stories. We each got to hand-select our own stories, and we've been interviewing, we've been researching, we've been working so incredibly hard on this project, so make sure to give that a check out. Also, make sure to check us out on Twitter, Instagram, uh, my handles are always at Abby M. Helpin. Uh, my dad's handles are at J. Helpin 37. And the H2 Sports Podcast handles are at H2 Sports Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. Special thank you to Mick for taking time to sit down with me at 730 in the morning. We will see you soon with another episode.